We're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 in our extended invitation this evening, afternoon, wherever we are. Look at 2 Timothy 3. And um, I'm hopeful that we have a you know, more things to say about 2 Timothy 3 in, uh, you know, coming weeks in our teaching. But I wanted to start with the high-level observation that I made this last time that we were doing this, or the last time I was looking at this, that there is a big picture on this verse that we know probably from memory where we find that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Probably one of those verses that a lot of people commit to memory and something that's well known, but there is uh, really something that needs to be said about this that I think uh, maybe I haven't said before and uh, uh, should be pointed out that there is in fact, a main idea controlling these verses, the ones that follow it and the ones that lead up to it. The main idea is that the Bible provides every tool that a teacher might need. That's the point of that verse. When he says that it provides, um, or that the Scripture is profitable for these things, so that, the 17th verse, the man of God may be complete. The man of God he's talking about is the teacher. And to be complete, equipped for every good work, means that these tools that he's talking about supply everything that you need to have and everything you need to do as a teacher of the Word of God. This is what is actually meant by these verses. The, the scripture, the, the writing, the, you know, the Bible is what provides everything. It's supplying the teacher. The man of God is the, is the intended recipient here rather than you know, the general population of the churches, although it's true. And we, we shouldn't think that, you know, we're not saying that you can't read it and that you can't take from it for yourself some teaching, some reproof, some correction, some training from the Word of God. You certainly can, and indeed you should. But that's not really what Paul is getting at here. What he's saying to Timothy is, you've seen how I lived. You know how your mother, is it Lois and grandmother Eunice or vice versa, but whatever. You know how these people lived before you. And you know, in the future, there is a time for them not to put up with sound teaching. What's in between those things? It's this. The Bible gives you everything that you need. That's what the meaning is. Every item in this list, uh, you know, all, all of these tools, the supplies for the teacher... The teaching, the reproof, the correction, the training in righteousness. These are all things that you do as a teacher for other people. They're all kind of outward facing. You take the Bible and you use it to do this, to teach. You use it to give reproof. You use it to make corrections. You use it to train other people. Again, not that you can't read these things for yourself and take them to heart, but that's not what he's talking about. He's telling Timothy, this is what you need. See, before this, in chapter 2, he had told him at verse 2, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 
2 Timothy 2, verse 2. This is not, as much as brethren want it to be, this is not authority for Bible colleges. That's not in the Bible, actually. This is in the Bible. Faithful gospel teachers teach other men who are faithful, and they will be able to go on and teach others who are faithful. That's the Bible pattern. This is what Paul did. You heard it from me. You take it and give it to others. On the one hand, and then on the other hand, you go to the flip side of this in the fourth chapter, and you see that he must preach the word, ready in season and out of season, with reproof, rebuke, and exhortation, complete patience and teaching. You notice these things correspond to the list in verse 16? Profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. It does correspond, because that's what he's talking about. Why do you have to do this? Because, third verse of 2 Timothy 4, the time is coming, which is to say there is a time for, according to Ecclesiastes 3, a time for people not to endure sound teaching. Having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. But as for you, you always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist. You see, it's teachers in focus is what he's saying to him. You heard from me. You take that and give it to other men who are faithful, and they'll be able to do the same thing. There is a time when people won't endure. There is a time when it is out of season, when nobody wants to hear the truth, but you keep teaching it. But he said they won't endure sound teaching. You know what sound means? Sound is to make healthy. It's uh, In fact, this is the... Uh, this is the word from which we get our word, hygiene. It's good for you. It makes for good health. Sound teaching is teaching that makes healthy. The sound teaching improves the learner's spiritual health. And of course, unsound teaching is teaching that is not improving people's spiritual health or soundness. But the sound teaching that they will not endure. There's a time when it will not be endured. 4.3 says. Must be what he was saying above in 3.16. Teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. The sound teaching of 2 Timothy 4.3 must be the kind of teaching that employs the tools laid out in 2 Timothy 3.16. What Paul's telling Timothy is, here's your Bible, and here's how to use it. You make application. That's what they call making application. Application is the instruction, the correction, the reproof, the training. If it, you know, if somebody is teaching and their teaching does not feature instruction, does not feature reproof, does not feature correction, is not training others, that teaching is not improving spiritual outcomes. That teaching is not improving the spiritual health of the people who are listening to it. That teaching is unsound. What that means. And just before this, in chapter 3, verse 14, we'll close with this thought here. He said to them, as for you, I'm sorry, to Timothy, as for you, Timothy, you continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
This is what comes immediately before that 16th verse about the sacred writings being breathed by God and profitable. But you see what he's doing here? <laughs> the 13th verse, I'm sorry, the 10th verse of 2 Timothy 3, he said, You have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim, my life, my faith, my patience, love, and steadfastness, persecutions, and sufferings. But as for you, you continue in what you've learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you learned it. From whom did he learn it? Did he learn it from Paul? No. Did he learn it from his mother and his grandmother? No. From whom is pointing to God? Timothy learned his faith from the sacred writings. Holy Scripture is the other way of saying that. The sacred writings, the Bible. When he says to him, all Scripture, all the writing is God-breathed, what he's saying to him is, the Scriptures are the voice of God. And that's a distinct voice from the voice of Paul and the voice of his mother and the voice of his grandmother and the voice of his nation and the voice of his ancestors. That's not the voice of God. The scriptures are the voice of God. You saw what happened to me. 2 Timothy 3, 10 and 11. I know about the faith that first dwelt in your mother, chapter 1, verse 5. Your grandmother Lois, your mother Eunice, I'm sure it now dwells in you, right? But from childhood, he's been acquainted with the sacred writings. Now, I'm not saying his mother, his mother didn't do right or his grandmother didn't do right. We're not saying that at all, or that they were not an influence. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, whatever influence they were, it was to get him acquainted with the Bible. And the Bible is right. And the Bible is the voice of God. I'm sure he was a good boy and he listened to his mother, but he wasn't listening to his mother. You see, when he was reading the Bible, he was listening to God. That's what we're saying. That's what will make you wise through salvation or for salvation. It's not the human tradition, the human touch, the things that were done in front of you by other people who have lived right and done good. That's not where it comes from. God speaks to me today through his word, the Bible. You want to hear God's voice, you have to listen by reading the Bible for yourself. That's how you get the power. That's what will make you wise. I hope that your parents did right. Mine did not. But it doesn't matter. If your parents did right, the right that they did was to point you to the Bible and to say the Bible is right. And you believe not them, but the Bible. That's from whom you learned it. That's what Paul is telling him. You saw what I taught. You saw what happened to me. You know what your mother and your grandmother believed and how they brought you up. And you know that the time is coming when they're not going to listen to this. But in between those things, he says, the thing you need is the Bible. It's everything. It's the only tool that you need. It has all the tools that the teacher needs. All the work that has to be done, the instruction, the reproof, the correction, and the training. Everything that a teacher has to do to be a teacher that is right with God. The Bible supplies all of that. 
That's what Paul's saying, very plainly. Which is not to take away from the fact that Paul did right or the fact that Timothy's mother and grandmother did right. They did, and that's good, and I'm glad that that happened. I hope that that is happening for you in your life, that you have others who are doing right before you and who have lived right before you and have made good choices before you. I hope that that's true. But ultimately, God is right. It's not who is right, it's what is right. The Bible is right. God is right. Our faith isn't in what others did or didn't do, what others thought or said or wrote or practiced. It's just irrelevant, frankly. It's irrelevant. The Bible is the only thing that matters. It's the only source of truth. It's the only source of authority. It's what any teacher needs to accomplish what God intends for teachers to accomplish. Don't mix it up with other things, right? Don't dilute the potency of the solution that God has given the Bible. Take hold of that which is truly life. Take hold of that which is the real power of God to salvation. Embrace that thing. Yeah, it's the real irony, I think, when I think of I think of people talking about the restoration movement, um, if that even existed, I'm not sure. But I'm told that it existed. The irony of that is the only thing I hear about those guys in the 1800s was that they were thinking about how to get back to a New Testament. And their parents and their grandparents in Europe had been uh, members of you know Protestant denominations. The irony about this is today, if we're looking back to the 1800s, 150 years ago, what you see there is people who were exactly not doing that. They were not looking back 150 years to see what was done before them. They were looking back 2,000 years to see what did God say to do. Let's do that. If they were doing it. I'm not even sure that existed, to be honest with you. <laughs> I've heard a lot of people with Scottish and Irish roots who had members of the church in the 1800s and the 1700s. I don't know if I believe this thing, to be honest with you. But whether it's true or whether it's not true, irrelevant. The point is, if anybody was faithful in that generation, they were faithful the same way that anybody is faithful today is. They hear the truth, they obey the truth. They obey the gospel that is contained in the pages of Scripture. That is the power. That's where uh, everything that we need comes from. Today, are you a Christian? Become a Christian. Obtain for yourself forgiveness of sins. That you might walk a new life with hope, with promise for tomorrow and for eternity. God will help you in this life by not allowing you to be tempted beyond what you are able. God will give you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 details that at some length. And you have a clean conscience, being honest with yourself and with your God. There are many blessings to being a Christian besides what Jesus said. There's no one who's left father or mother, houses, or children, lands for my name's sake and the gospels who will not receive a hundredfold in this life. That if you have to leave some things, if you have to walk away, well, God supplies you in the church. There are people who are Christians who love you. And as the Bible says, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's true. Christians are closer. You think we're members of the same family. No, actually, we're members of the same body. <laughs> we're closer than that. He said we are members of the same body, the body of Christ. If you need the prayers of the saints today and have not lived right, repent, make things right with God. Let us pray for you that you might be restored to him before it's too late. If you need to obey the gospel, we have made arrangements with a hotel to be sure we have water available for you to be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. If today you need our prayers as a Christian, or if today you need to obey the gospel to become a Christian, we're glad to help you. Please let your need be known in the Spirit by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>